Hello everyone and welcome to the Tank Club. Today I'm going to be showing you my build, the Accolade Dragon Knight Tank Build. Now this is an improvement on my previous build, the Tribute Tank Build, and we've kind of changed some things. We've updated it, we've increased the DPS, we've made a lot of adjustments to this, um, and this build in general is based on the original idea by Deltia from Deltia's Gaming, and we've kind of taken that build, we updated it with the tribute build, and now we're kind of moving on to bigger and better things. We're taking this build to kind of the next stage. Now this build is a tank build, which can also output damage. And it's also now with this new updated version going to provide more group utility and support. So it's kind of got the best of both worlds. This build is ideal. It's an all round DK tank build for everything other than vet trials. So with this build you'll be able to complete overland content as a tank such as world bosses, delves, quests, dolmens, all that kind of stuff. You'll be able to complete solo arenas such as Maelstrom Arena and Vatashran Hollows on veteran as well. And you'll also be able to do tank things such as dungeons, random dungeons, pledges, vet hard mode dungeons. All of those things are possible with this build. The only things that I would suggest you don't try to do, don't try to do DLC vet dungeons, don't try to do vet trials, but all of the content is it's more than capable of being completed with this build. So if you are looking for something to use in a more organized and optimized group, make sure you check out the tankclub.com for my dungeon tank build. And we have individual tank builds for every single trial for every single class. So that is where you need to go if you're looking for builds to complete certain trials and all that kind of stuff. So the Accolade build is a Dragon Knight tank that can do everything. Now you could utilize the same kind of gear and idea with other classes. I'm focusing on the Dragon Knight because this is my main character. So obviously I'm going to use this build to be doing a lot of quests and achievements and overland content and all that kind of stuff. So for me, I'm using a Dragon Knight, but this would more than easily be convertible onto other classes as well, depending on whatever your main character is. So this build is for people like myself who only ever play as a tank. Obviously, I am a main tank and I only really play as a tank. I enjoy the tank gameplay and I don't really like to play other roles. I'm a, a very much a support role player. The problem with Elder Scrolls Online is the fact that being a tank offers you no ability to perform any kind of damage, usually. And that is a little bit of a problem for players that want to do that overland content, they want to go and collect sky shards, they want to do delves and get skill points and do achievements and quest lines. It can be really, really tricky in that situation to utilize a tank for doing that sort of content. So this build is going to give you the option of still being able to output damage, still enjoy playing Elder Scrolls Online, but still maintaining the fact that you are a tank. The DPS output of this build will be somewhere in the region of 20 to 30k, depending on the environment that you're in. There is also an option to add in a companion with this build that will offer you around another 7k DPS. So all in all, a good amount of damage for the sort of content that we're going to be trying to do. So you're going to be able to output damage with this build, you're going to be able to kill stuff, but you're going to still be tank enough to do the tank based things that you need to do as well. So we're going to get straight into it. I hope you enjoy the build and let's go. So first of all, the race for this build. My personal preference is Imperial. This is purely because this is, in my opinion, the best tank race currently. And my main Dragon Knight tank character is an Imperial. So I'm not changing this for this build. I'm just maintaining the same race. Um, and the Imperial is still good for this build, no matter what. So when we take a little look, um, Diplomat isn't doesn't really make much difference. But when we get to the other stuff, uh, we've got the Tough Passive, increases your max health by 2,000. Imperial Metal increases your max stamina by 2,000. This is very good for, obviously, improving our damage. And then Red Diamond reduces the cost of all your abilities by 6%. This is very, very helpful as well. So all of our... Abilities, 6% reduced in cost. This also includes our block, our dodge roll, our ultimate, everything. So, a very, very useful passive. And for me personally, I want to be able to use this build for doing the overland content. But I'm also in groups for trials where they need me to be on 
a character that I can play trials, I can do vet trials, I can do the vet trial hard modes, and we're doing all that sort of content as well. So all I do is I convert my gear and my skills for solo situations, and then I go with my usual trials builds for those other situations when I'm in those organized groups. In terms of the attributes, we've gone with five points into Magicka, 24 into Health, 35 into Stamina. And the reason we've gone with those stats is when combined with our champion points, it gives us the attributes and the max stats that we want. So Magicka, we want to hit that kind of 18k mark. We are still needing to do things like chaining enemies when we're in dungeons. So we have to have some kind of format where we're able to do that. Max health is 31.5k. This is without any kind of buffs from a warden and stuff. So this is going to go up a little bit. This can be quite low in terms of trying to do vet content. So you do have to be careful. You're not going to be able to do DLC vet dungeons because there's a lot of hard hitting fights in that content and 31k health wouldn't be enough. When it comes to vet trials as well, 31k health is not going to be enough for that content. We have got to sacrifice some health to get our max stamina higher because we are going to be doing a lot of skills. We need max stamina. We need to be able to output damage. So 31k health is tanky enough to be able to tank normal dungeons and kind of vet non-DLC dungeons, normal trials, that kind of content. But it's just not high enough for that more top-end vet content. Our max stamina is nearly 31k. This is obviously vital because it is going to be tricky um, to sustain this build on long boss fights if you're not able to manage your stamina properly. Having a good stamp pool to start with is very, very helpful. Uh, Magicka Recovery is quite important with this build, like I said before, because we are still going to have to do things like chains, talons, and little things like that when we go into group content. The Health and Stamina Recovery, um, not that great. Uh, health Recovery isn't super important. Stamina Recovery is kind of important for this build because it's a tank DPS build. It's not solely a tank build, so we do need a little bit of Stamina Recovery. 701 is where it's at, but... We're going to be using champion points to kind of try and make up for the, the lower end of the stamina recovery. The uh, damage stats, these are unbuffed stats. So our weapon damage is 4,098 unbuffed. So that's going to be what's increased, where we're going to get our damage from when using this build. Weapon critical is 14.4, which is extremely low. This is why the damage is kind of limited to around that 20 to 30k mark. Because the critical damage is not going to be there. But our base damage... Is going to be coming. We're going to be we're going to be utilizing that, but we're not looking to output hundreds and hundreds of k's worth of DPS. We're looking to dish out enough damage to get through easier content, to get through quests, and to get through overland content. We we don't need more than 30k, and that's where we're at. In terms of our resistances, 17k is on the lower end once again. That's why this isn't a vet dungeon, a vet trial build. When we buff up, it is enough though, and because this is on the waking flame. DLC, we don't need more resistances. You're going to see why in a few minutes. So, because of our champion points, we actually don't need more resistances. If we go down a little bit, um, we've got kind of, if we look at our stats here, we've got block mitigation, which is 70%. This is very, very vital for this build, and it's even going to go up further than that. We are actually going to be hitting the block mitigation cap with this build. So, we don't need more resistances because we're going to be hitting 90% block mitigation when we're in combat. So that means we don't need to have more resistances. We're already going to be reducing damage by 90% when we block, which is absolutely insane for a damage dealer build. Our block cost is 905. That's not ideal. It's not great, but we are not going to be blocking huge portions of time because, as I've said already, this is going to be for easier content, and that sort of content you won't need to block. So we are going to be able to manage that reasonably well. In terms of the Munda stone, we've got the Atronarch Mundus. Um, this is something that you can change regularly. So you can use the Atronarch Mundus. You can also use a damage-based Munda stone, depending on what you're kind of trying to achieve. So in dungeon content, you are going to need the Atronarch because you are going to need to be spamming chains and talons and things like that. So you are going to probably need the Atronarch. In more solo content, you could go with something that's going to provide more damage. So that is an option 
you can choose and you can chop and change this depending on what environment you're focusing on. If you've got a quick access to Munda Stones, obviously that won't be an issue. So Magicka Recovery for general use, if you want more damage, then feel free to switch it to a damage based Munda Stone. The food we're going to be using is the Bewitched Sugar Skulls. This is going to provide us with all three stats. This is useful for what we're trying to get out of it. So we need max health. We've got 3,937 max health. And then we've got max stamina and magicka at 3,622. We've just got a little bit of health recovery in there. That is going to help us a little bit, don't get me wrong. The extra health recovery, 393 health recovery. As you can see, we've got 1,158 health recovery. So every two seconds, we're going to get that 1,158 tick of healing. That's going to help a little bit so that we don't have to cast as much healing skills. In terms of potions, just we're going to just use regular kind of tri stat potions. I'm using the crown ones. You can use the crown ones if you've got them. You can use the crafted ones. It doesn't really matter. We're looking to get that boost of resources. So we're getting health, magicka, and stamina. Plus, we're getting major fortitude, major intellect, and major endurance, which in increasing our recovery even further. Um, and that's really important as well. So we can get those recovery stats much, much awesome. higher. So on to the gear sense. Now, we have made a little change to some of the gear sets with this build this time around. Um, I've tried to make it so that so it provides more benefit to the user, but also to the group as well. So our first set is the Seventh Legion set. Now this set provides weapon damage, so we get the two piece bonus, one two nine weapon damage, three piece bonus, one two nine health recovery, four piece bonus is six five seven weapon critical. And then the five items, when you cast an ability that increases your physical or spell resistance while in combat, you gain 341 weapon damage and 341 health recovery for 15 seconds. And this can occur every 15 seconds. So as long as we're casting a armor buff while in combat, we are going to benefit from a nice boost in weapon damage and health recovery. Very, very nice. Um, so for this, we're going to just use the one hand and shield. For the, for the one hand, we're using Nernhorn to increase the damage of this weapon. Um, and then we're also using a Crusher Enchant on the front bar. We're then going to be using the Shield of Seventh Legion as well. That's in Divines with Stamina. You could, if you wanted to, use Sturdy Gear. I'm using Divines because I do like to switch my Munda Stone to be more damage oriented to try and boost my DPS when I'm in solo situations. Um, when you're using the, the Atronach Mundus, obviously you get a huge boost of Magicka Recovery. But you could also just use Sturdy Gear if you're struggling to deal with the block cost side of it. But my personal preference for this build is to have Divine's Gear. So for 7th Legion, we only use it on the front bar. Um, we don't need it to be on both bars. So we just use it in a way where we can utilize it on one bar. We also use the chest piece. Again, we're using a Stamina Enchant. We're using Divine's. And it's in Heavy. This, this gear set comes in Heavy. So we utilize it in a way where we get a few heavy pieces and mostly medium so we can maximize our damage. Uh, and then we're also using the legs and the feet. So all divine stamina um, and it's all heavy. So we're using three pieces of heavy armor with this build. Uh, the next piece of gear we're using on the back bar is the master's perfected maul. It doesn't have to be perfected. You can use the non-perfected if you want. This is known honed. It's also got a weapon damage enchant. And the reason we're using this, so it adds 1190 physical penetration and increases the direct damage cleave deals by 1150 for each enemy in its cone. So the previous version of this build lacked some cleave damage. We've now prevent we're gonna get away from that problem. Um, we're gonna be utilizing the master's two-hander and cleave to kind of benefit from a bit of survivability with the shield that we're gonna get and also we're going to benefit from that cleave damage and the increased damage by using cleave as well. Our monster set is Tremor Scale. Um, this is going to be in medium armor, both pieces, the head and the shoulder. And again, divines with stamina enchants. The reason we use this, we gain uh, max stamina for the one piece. And then for the two piece, when you activate a taunt ability on an enemy, you cause a June Ripper to burst from the ground beneath them after one second, dealing. 3760 physical damage to all enemies within 4 meters and reducing their physical resistance by 2395 for 8 seconds. This effect can occur every 8 seconds and the damage scales off the highest of your physical or spell resistance. So we are going to be using this gear set because we are basically a stamina hybrid damage dealer tank. 
So we do need to have a good amount of physical resistance reduction on the enemies to be able to maximize our damage. But also, this is a group buff set. Now, it's only a group buff set in a stamina group, but it's still providing some group benefit. But it's also causing damage, and we're using taunt as a spammable skill. We're going to be using both of the taunts, actually. We're using two taunts with this build, and they are both very, very useful. So we're going to be making use of the taunt skills to maximize our damage. And this is also going to proc every eight seconds while we're doing so. Uh, and then we've got the shoulder as well. That's medium, and same again, tremor scale, stamina, divines. Our final gear set is Powerful Assault. Uh, I've, I've tried to make this easy so that you only need the easy pieces to obtain. So it shouldn't cost you a lot. In this situation, I'm using a belt. I'm using the hands. And then I'm using the jewelry. So obviously we're using... Um, this This has been updated for this patch. So it's, it's a lot better now. And the reason why I've switched to this instead of the previous set we were using is because... The previous set that we used was the Knight Errant's Mail, and that only buffed your uh, your weapon damage to your one hand and shield abilities. Now, by using Powerful Assault instead, we're going to benefit from the increased weapon and spell damage on all of our abilities, but also we're going to be able to provide this benefit to our group. So we're kind of making this build a little less selfish, a little more group utility, but at the same time, we're helping ourselves because... This has got a little bit less weapon and spell damage compared to Knight Errant, but we are going to benefit from the fact that it's all abilities. So we are using this on the belt, the hands, and then we are using it on the neck, the rings. Now, for me, I'm using infused weapon damage on all three pieces. Robust weapon damage would also be very, very good. Um, I was just kind of testing out both options um i do think that robust would help you a lot because then you could even get a little bit more max health so if you're using robust you're going to have a huge amount of extra stamina so you might need that if you're struggling for sustain with this build then use robust if you are struggling with the amount of health you've got then use robust and put more points into health so you have got a bit of you have got some options to change this to make it a little stronger um, and to be able to utilize it a bit better for yourself so that is the gear and now onto the skills so, first of all, on our front bar, we've got our first skill, Pierce Armor. Now, this is a vital skill. Two reasons this is very important. So, first of all, the cost of it is very, very cheap. So, this is our spammable skill. 999 stamina to use, which is... It's a very, very cheap skill. We can use this, and this helps us to keep outputting some damage without too much cost. Um, but then, one of the huge points about this, it's a taunt. It's also going to proc Tremor Scale. It's also going to taunt enemies when we're doing group content. Um, but then it's going to cause 4,407 physical damage, which is not too bad. It's going to increase when we're in combat as well, because we're going to have, obviously, much more weapon damage. Um, it also inflicts Minor Breach and Major Breach on the enemy, reducing their physical and spell resistance by 2,974 and 5,948. As I said already, we need to have the physical resistance reduction on enemies to be able to maximize our damage. So by using this skill as our spammable, along with Tremor Scale and some other sources of a physical pen, we're able to actually create more damage for ourselves by doing that. Our next skill is Razor Caltrops. Now, we're using this skill for two reasons. We need to proc Powerful Assault. So we're using Caltrops to be able to, to, be able to do that. We're also using it for the Snare and for some AoE cleave damage. So, hurl a ball of caltrops and scatter over the target area, dealing 1162 physical damage every one second to enemies inside and reduce their movement speed by 50%. Enemies who take damage from the caltrops have major breach applied to them, reducing their physical and spell resistance by 5948 for four seconds. So, we're kind of getting a, a double benefit from this in a way, because when you are in a solo situation and using this skill, you're not going to be taunting every enemy. You're probably going to be cleaving them down with your master's two-hander. So we're able to throw caltrops on a bunch of enemies. We're able to snare them. We're able to do some cleave damage with the physical damage every second. But then we also get major breach. So when we're using that that cleave, when we're using that master's two-hander and we're carving people down, we're also going to have major breach applied, which is going to give us more damage. The next skill is power slam. 
This is a flex slot, so this is a slot where you could remove this skill to use something such as chains. Even in solo content, having chains is a really, really nice skill to have, like when you're in Maelstrom Arena, chaining the enemies over to you so you don't have to keep moving. You can chain some of the enemies to you, and it makes it a bit easier, and it also causes damage. Chains is also a free DPS skill in situations where you might be low on resources, but you still want to be doing some damage. You can just spam chains, and if it's on a boss or an enemy that has already been chained, they don't move, so it just refunds the cost. So it's free damage in that situation. But Power Slam is an additional skill that you would use when you get chance to. So you're going to make sure all your dots and things are down first, and then if you've got some an abundance of stamina, you'd start to spam Power Slam. It's also quite useful because when using Power Slam, um, you strike an enemy with full force, dealing 8817 physical damage. While slotted, blocking an attack grants you a stack of resentment, which increases the damage of your next power slam by 5% for 5 seconds, and you can stack it up to 10 times. So what you can do is, in a situation where you've got to block an attack, you can block it, maybe block a couple of attacks, and then follow it up with a power slam. So it's kind of useful in situations where you've got to block occasionally because you're able to output a nice burst of damage, and it's going to get buffed up when you need to... When, when you're able to kind of use it. So that's kind of nice. Our next skill is Venomous Claw. Now with this build, we are kind of going to rely on a lot of dot damage. We're going to use Venomous Claw. We've already got Caltrops in there. We don't want a lot of skills that we have to keep using really, really often. We have to try and use, utilize skills that we can place or activate and then leave them to run and cause damage because we are still having to tank. And so by using skills like Venomous Claw, which has got a 10 second duration, it's going to cause a lot of damage over a long period of time. So, rake an enemy with your claw dealing 4266 poison damage and an additional 15,519 poison damage over 14 seconds. So it lasts for a long time. These are skills that we need. Skills that are going to keep happening over long periods of time so that we don't have to focus on casting them constantly. We can focus on tanking and then we can output damage alongside that. Uh, the poison seeps into the target and deals increased damage the longer it lasts, dealing 20% more damage every 2 seconds. Um, the enemies hit with the initial hit are afflicted with the poison status effect. This is also going to provide us with some sustain, thanks to our passives when we cause poison damage. So really, really nice to have this as well. Next skill is Volatile Armor. Um, this is our armor buff, so... Release your inner dragon to gain major resolve, increasing your physical and spell resistance by 5948 for 20 seconds. This is also going to proc uh, 7th Legion, so we need a skill that does major resolve. Uh, you release a spray of spikes around you, causing enemies to take 6930 magic damage over 10 seconds. So, because we've got to use this skill to proc 7th Legion, we've got to use this skill to give us major resolve, and it's going to cause extra free damage, that's why we use this skill for solo environments. If you really wanted to, if you don't want that extra little bit of damage, you could also try using balance instead. There's no like downside to using balance, so if you are in a situation where you do chain a lot of enemies and things like that, you will just switch the skill. Uh, while active, the armor returns 979 magic damage to any enemy that uses a direct damage attack against you in melee range. So it's doing lots and lots of different bits of damage we're trying to maximize damage while tanking, so this is another really good skill for doing so. Finally, we've got Spell Wall. Uh, this skill reinforces your shield, allowing you to automatically block all attacks at no cost and reflect projectiles cast at you for seven seconds. So the reason we use this skill, it's not the skill, it's not the ultimate skill that you're going to be using. It is on your bar as an emergency. So it's got a really cheap cost at 126 ultimate. That is on because we're an Imperial, it's a little bit cheaper. Um, and the reason, like I say, we, we use this because if we're in a bit of a sticky situation or we run out of resources, we can use this to get a burst of resources. And because it automatically blocks for us, we can just heavy attack during that during that phase to get our resources back. So in situations where you're taking a lot of damage, maybe all your teammates have died in a group con piece of group content, maybe you, you've run out of resources, you can just pop this ultimate, get resources back, get reses, do things you need to do, to be able to function and improve your situation. So it's an emergency, um, an emergency ultimate. On to the onto the bank bar. So we've got Inner Beast, which is our range taunt. In the previous build, we didn't have a range taunt, but this has been updated with this patch. So we've got uh, this is the stamina morph of the range taunt. 
The reason we use the Stamina Morph is because this has got some damage benefits to us now as a tank. So if we take a little look, Ignite the Fire of Hate in an enemy's heart, dealing 4 to 7 9 physical damage and taunting them to attack you for 15 seconds. The enemy takes 10% more damage from your attacks while this effect persists if they are not a player. So when we range taunt an enemy, that enemy is now going to take 10% more damage from our attacks. So we can we have to apply this. When we when we kind of instigate combat with enemies, especially bosses, you've got to be using this particular skill. You're going to inner beast the enemy and they're going to take 10% more damage from all your skills. So this is just really really good. It gives us that option now of having the range taunt which we didn't have before, but we also get a really really nice boost to our damage. So it's just something that we can't turn down. Uh, we also offer the group a synergy, so a ranged ally targeting the enemy has a 50% chance to activate the Radiate Synergy dealing 8277 magic damage to them over 3 seconds, an additional 8285 magic damage to them and other nearby enemies. So we've got some extra damage for our group as well, so we cannot complain at that. Okay, next is another skill, um, Noxious Breath, another long duration damage over time skill. That's the reason we're using it. We're not going to be using it for the major breach that it offers because we've already got so many sources of major breach. We've already got Caltrops. Um, we've already got Pierce Armor. Noxious Breath is being used because it causes poison damage for a long period of time. It does a lot of damage. So, exhale a corrosive blast to enemies in front of you, dealing 6629 poison damage and an additional 12,047 poison damage over 14 seconds. As I say, it does major breach as well, but that's not why we're using it. We're using it for that cleave damage. We're using it for that extra dot. We're using it because it's not very expensive, 1,850 stamina. So we're keeping our dots active. Um, and this is going to cause a lot of damage over the course of those kind of fights. Our next skill is Brawler. This is a two-hander skill. Um, and the reason we're using this is because we're obviously using the Master's two-handed weapon. And with this skill, focus your strength into a mighty swing dealing 6418 physical damage to enemies in front of you. So that's all enemies. If you've got a stack of 20 enemies in front of you, it's going to hit them all at the same time. You also gain a damage shield that absorbs 5936 damage for 6 seconds. Each enemy hit increases the damage shield strength by 50% up to 300%. So this is another vital reason. Because we're tanking, because we are going to be dealing with adds, skill now offers us the option of some cleave damage which we didn't really have before this was a particular problem in the previous version of this build is we did lack some cleave damage so if you were trying to solo a dungeon or get through certain bits of content where there was a number of adds it could have been quite tricky but now we've kind of overcome that problem now this is not a skill you're going to spam because it costs nearly 2600 stamina so it's not something you're going to be going in and spamming it um, but if you utilize it at the right time so that you can get a little bit of cleave damage, you can get the damage shield. We, we are going to get that 300% damage shield potentially in those ad pulls and things like that. So we're going to get huge damage shield. We're going to get some really, really good cleave damage. If you've thrown a Caltrops down in front of an enemy, you run in, you use your Noxious Breath, you use your Volatile Armor, and then you swing with Brawler, you are going to get some really, really nice damage and you're going to be able to cleave enemies down very, very easily. And the fact that we've got the damage shield means that you won't need to block in ad pulls. This is an important factor of this skill. When you go into an ad pull, you won't need to block. So you can go in, you can use Brawler, you're going to proc that shield, you're going to get that damage, you're not going to need to block, you just need to make sure that if there's a heavy attack incoming, obviously that you block that. But you won't need to block in ad pulls if you're using this particular weapon because it's going to cause so much damage and it's going to give you such a huge damage shield. You can just avoid blocking altogether. Even in kind of the base game vet dungeons if you are doing that kind of content. Our next skill is Flames of Oblivion. Um, this skill is kind of part one of two, which means that we don't need to use weapon power potions. So we don't use weapon power potions with this build. We use the tristat potions, which are tank potions, let's say. And the reason we don't need to use weapon power potions is because we're using Flames of Oblivion for one of the parts of that. Now this is a nice little skill. So activate an aura of flames, which launches a fireball at two enemies every five seconds dealing 6991 flame damage. While slotted, you gain major prophecy and major savagery, increasing weapon and spell critical by 2629. And this ability scales off your highest offensive stat. So it's gonna it's gonna go off our weapon damage because we've got really high weapon damage, and that's gonna also increase in combat. 
The nice thing about this skill is it, it hits multiple enemies, and it also costs Magicka. So we've got a little bit of a Magicka skill in there, so that we aren't, we're not having to spam loads and loads of stamina skills. We're, have, we're able to utilize a little bit of Magicka-based damage as well. On to kind of part two of the reason why we don't need the weapon power potions is because we're using Rally. So this is a long duration skill, 20 seconds. Focus your strength and resolve, gain major brutality, increasing your weapon damage by 20%. So there you go. That's why we don't need to use weapon power potions. We're going to be getting the major brutality via this skill. You also gain minor endurance, increasing your stamina recovery by 15% for 20 seconds. Obviously, we already get major endurance from using potions, and then we're going to get minor endurance by using this skill as well. So we get all that extra stamina recovery. You heal for 4,036 health when rally ends, and the final heal is increased by 15% every one second, up to a maximum of 300%. Now, you can leave this to run its full duration, but this is also your main healing skill. So we don't have any other healing skill on our bar. Um, we only have Brawler, which is giving us those huge shields. And then we're kind of utilizing our champion points to gain a little bit of healing. So if you take a big hit, you have to cast Rally to get that health back. So you need to make sure this is running at all times. You make sure that you cast Rally as a pre-buff before you go into combat. If you then take a hit and you need to heal, you would cast Rally again and that will give you a heal. If you leave it to run its full duration, you get a bigger heal. The longer you leave it, the bigger the heal. So you don't want to be using it straight after you've cast it, because you do have to then cast it twice. That's really expensive. But this is the way that you're going to heal yourself if you need to. We've then got Standard of Might. So we are using this as our main ultimate. This is the ultimate we want to use. This is causing us a lot of damage. This is one of the ways we get lots and lots of damage. So we need to make sure this is active as, as much as possible. Cool down a battle standard dealing... 4346 flame damage every one second for 20 seconds um, to enemies and applying major defile to them, which is the healing received and the health recovery. Standing in the area increases your damage done and reduces your damage taken by 15%. So we get a damage buff and a damage reduction as well, which is really nice since we're a tank. Allies can activate the shackle synergy, dealing 10,185 flame damage to the enemies in the area and immobilizing them for 5 seconds. So this is our main ultimate that we are going to use when we're doing solo content okay in terms of group content we can change we can change our skills a little bit to accommodate group content a little bit better so we can use unrelenting grip as a skill um, to kind of for group content to help us we need to chain enemies if we're going into dungeons you're going to need to do that so unrelenting grip is going to be vital you can use this anyway on this build. I actually quite like using this generally because it's nice to have. It's a magic of skill. Um, it gives us a speed boost. It causes flame damage. It's free on a, on a boss enemy. So it's kind of a nice skill to have. Um, but mainly for group content you need it for stacking enemies. So we've got that skill. You can use balance as well. So to be able to afford the cost of chaining multiple enemies in, you can use balance that's going to cost health and give back magicka. And it's also your armor buff that's going to proc your 7th legion. Now you can also change your front bar ultimate for group content if you want a bit more magicka recovery. Your slot replenishing barrier. That's going to give you the magicka aid passive, increasing your magicka recovery by 10%. You don't have to do this, but if you do want that extra magicka recovery, then you could switch it. In terms of the back bar, again, you could drop um, a skill and slot choking talons. It's not 100% necessary because... You're already using Caltrops, which is going to give a huge snare. So you're going to reduce movement speed by 50% of the enemies. So that can kind of often be enough to deal with um, a group of enemies. So as long as you're chaining onto your Caltrops and then they're snared, that's usually enough. If you do want to offer a bit more to your group, then obviously you can use Choking Talons to root those enemies in place. It also does help yourself as well, because then when you use your Brawler, in the enemies are all stacked there, they're just kind of stuck in place, and you can just swing Brawler to kill them. So that is something you can do. Um, in terms of back bar, again, you could switch your ultimate and you could use aggressive horn. If you really wanted to, you could use aggressive horn on your front bar and then keep your standard of might on your back bar. So that way, in situations where, it, where your group um, maybe would benefit more from the aggressive horn, you could use that. Or maybe the situations where you need to benefit yourself a bit more on your own DPS, so you use standard of might. So you could do that. Aggressive horn would be better to help your group. 
and to kind of get a bit more damage out there. It increases your max magicka and max stamina by 10% for 30 seconds, and it also provides major force, increasing crit damage by 20%. So it is going to benefit you and your damage as well, but it's not going to provide as much DPS gain as it would. Like for solar situations, you're going to benefit way more from using Standard of Might. Now there are a few skills we're missing here, so you could, again, you could use Igneous Shield on this build, you could slot that. Um, if you really wanted to for group content to provide yourself a damage shield and your group a damage shield. And you could use Stone Giant, but this is going to be quite difficult to sustain. Um, but yeah, you would use this instead of other damage skills. So you wouldn't use all the same damage skills and Stone Giant. You'd use it in place of a damage skill in group content. I don't think it's worth using Stone Giant in solo content because you have to cast it every five seconds. Um, that is a bit of pressure, and if it drops off, then you start to lose damage. Um, and it's really expensive to be casting it every 5 seconds, especially for a tank-based DPS build. So, Stone Giant is something you can utilise, but not something I suggest for this particular build. Okay, passives. Um, in terms of Ardent Flame, you want to take everything. Uh, we're going to increase... Uh, by using Combustion, increasing the damage of Poison and Burning, we're getting both of those effects with the skills that we're going to use. And also, applying Burning... Or poisoned is going to restore some resources, and we're going to get both of those effects, so it's worth having those and benefiting from the sustain. We need warmth uh, because we're going to be dealing direct damage with an ardent flame ability. That is going to happen with our venom claw, um, so reducing the enemy's movement speed um, increases the damage over time from your fiery breath, saving so strike and dragonite standard by 33% and the dur duration by four seconds. We're using all three of those skills, so this is a vital passive. And then world of ruin. We need this as well, decreases the cost of your stamina, poison abilities by 25%. Really, really important. We want to take all the passives from Draconic Power, so increase block mitigation. We get some healing received. We get some health recovery. We get an increased range on the enemies, and we get some physical and spell resistance. This got changed this patch, so now it's not just spell resistance, it's a bit of both, which is kind of nice. Earthen Heart, these are the most important passives because, um, so we get the increased Earthen Heart dura duration is not important unless you're using Igneous Shield. Um, when you cast an ultimate ability, this is a great thing for us. We're going to restore 46 health, 46 magicka, 46 stamina for each point of ultimate cost that we use. Very important for our sustain on this build. We want to be using our ultimate as much as possible, and it's a way to get all our resources back. So every time you drop that Dragonite standard, we're going to get a huge boost to our resources, which is very, very nice to get. Mountain's Blessing, this is our kind of, this is our group buff. We would be providing minor brutality, increasing weapon damage by 10%. It's difficult to find a way to make use of this with our damage build. There's just not enough bar space. But if you can slot in your shield, you are going to benefit from the minor brutality for yourself and your group. Helping Hands is a great sustain skill for your stamina. So if you can find space to slot Igneous Shield, you are going to benefit from the increased stamina. Almost a thousand stamina. And every time you cast Igneous Shield, you're going to get that. So this is a way to, to improve sustain. But it's just difficult trying to find a way to get this onto the build. One hand and shield, you need all the passives. And then the same again for your two-hander. It's best just to take. Just take everything for both of those. Um, and then you can make sure you can utilize everything that there is there. You want all the medium armor passives because we are using... Quite a few pieces of medium armor so we're going to get the medium armor bonuses reduce cost of block reduce damage taken from area of effects all that kind of stuff we're going to benefit from increased crit damage the recovery extra stamina recovery reduce cost of our weapon abilities um you don't really need to have improved sneak reducing the cost of sneak and the detection area you don't need that if you don't if you don't have the skill points don't bother with that one because it's not really that important um increased weapon damage Nice again, and then Athletics, another really, really good one, reducing the cost of dodge roll and increasing our movement speed. Heavy Armor, you also want to take all of those. Um, as, as, you might, as you may know, there's now no such thing as a five-piece bonus when it comes to passives. So because we are using three pieces of Heavy Armor, we want to benefit from having the passives from the Heavy Armor as well. So we take them all, because we're going to get a thousand... Uh, physical and spell resistance. We're going to get 12% health recovery. We're going to restore magicka and stamina. 324 magicka and stamina. When we take damage um, every 4 seconds. So another little sustain tool. Um, Juggernaut, increase max health. So we're going to get 6%. Revitalize, increases magicka 
or stamina of heavy attacks by 4%. So we're going to get 12% more resources when we heavy attack because we're using a stamina weapon. And then rapid mending increases the healing receive 3% we're going to get from that. Um, in terms of other passives, fight skilled kind of stuff, you don't necessarily need any of those, but you can take them if you want. Um, Mages Guild, you obviously need these passives if you are using balance. If you're using balance, you'll need to take Major Adept, Everlasting Magic, and Magic Controller at least. And because we are a damage dealing tank, Might of the Guild is also kind of nice, giving you Empower for three seconds. So you don't usually really need to have this one, but since we are a damage based build, then it's nice to take this as well, if you are slight in balance. Undaunted. Obviously, we want to take both of these because they're very good. We're going to get um, bonuses when we use a synergy. So if some, if we're in brute content, someone uses a synergy ability, we're going to benefit from getting some resources back from that. Undaunted Metal, we're, using, we're not using a light piece. So we are going to benefit from 4% increased stats because we're using heavy and medium armor. For Assault, you just need a continuous attack for your Major Gallop. Um, that is pretty useful. Support Passives, you only need to take Magic Raid if you're slotting barrier. So if you're slotting barrier on your front bar for that extra magic recovery, make sure you've also got magic raid. Obviously take make sure you take all your racial passives as well because they are very very important. Um, and then you also want to take medicinal use to increase the effect of your potions when you use them. So we want to get the increased recovery from our tri stat potions upon using those. Okay our champion points. So as I mentioned before we've got some very important things with regards to the champion points. So the green champion points are just whatever you want. So whatever champion points you've got, put them wherever you want. If you were to say you wanted something that's going to benefit you in a combat situation, obviously Rationer, Liquid Efficiency, and Steed's Blessing are the most important ones. Um, Breakfall is kind of useful for reducing your fall damage. In some fights, there's fall damage, so that can be helpful. Otherwise, you just take whatever you want for the green CP. It doesn't really make that much difference. It's personal preference. Most of these are like crafting and um, kind of quest beneficial. So just choose them based on whatever you need in that situation. When it comes to the blue CP, so we are going to try and utilize the blue CP for some damage. First of all, we're using Grieving Blows. And this passage is going to, when we deal direct damage, we heal for 7% of the damage done. So this is how we're able to avoid slotting a healing skill other than our rally because we are going to be using Reaving Blows. Now, if you don't need this and you're able to you're able to survive without Reaving Blows, you could go for another damage passive. But I like to have it for me personally. Um, we're also using Thaumaturge, so increasing your damage done with damage over time effects by 2%. So we're going to get 10% more damage and we're using a lot of damage over time. A lot of our skills are damage over time, so this is really, really nice to improve that damage. Master at Arms is the next one, so increasing your damage done with direct damage attacks by 2% per stage. So 10% damage, we are using direct damage attacks, our taunts direct damage, um, and that's our main spammable damage skill. Um, our only other one, um, we're using Ironclad, reduces your damage taken by direct damage attacks, uh, we're going to get 10% damage reduction. So this is at the main source of damage that we usually take, so we're slotting this one. Um, our most important CP are... Elemental Aegis, we're getting 2% reduced damage. The most vital champion point really for the blue ones is preparation. 10% damage reduction. Just a straight up 10% damage reduction for 20 CP. You also want to get Hardy. The reason these three are so important, Hardy, Preparation, Elemental Aegis, is because they don't need to be slotted. They're just passive. So you want to get these and make sure you've got those because you're going to get the reduced damage. And we are still tanking enemies, so we don't want to be taking too much damage. Other CPs that you want to have, you want to have Tireless Discipline for the Max Stamina. You want Eldritch Insight for the Max Magicka. You do want to have Precision for the Crit Chance. You might as well take things like Blessing, Increase Healing Done, because it's not a slottable, it, it's just a passive CP, so you might as well get it. Um, the other important one is the Extended Might section of the Champion Points, so you want to get the Piercing, Max that out. You do want to get Flawless Ritual. You do want to get War Mage. And then over to the other side, Battle Mastery and Mighty are the two most important ones in here. You can get the other ones later, but in terms of playing this build for kind of Overland and kind of solo damage, you're going to need Piercing, you're going to need Battle Mastery, you're going to need Mighty. 
I do like to use Weapon Expert if I'm looking to improve the damage a little bit further. So I'd slot Weapon Expert instead of Reaving Blows. If I don't need Reaving Blows, then I'd go with that one instead and improve the damage from my Light and Heavy Attacks. Because I'm always Light Attack weaving in between skills. And you need a lot of Heavy Attacks on this build if you are kind of in a, in a tanky situation where you're blocking and trying to do damage. You will need to use a lot of Heavy Attacks to sustain. Uh, but your Heavy Attacks are doing good damage, especially for a tank. So it's still, it's still worth doing, and if you can benefit from the increased damage by slotting a CP that bu buffs them, then that's good as well. Usually tanks would need things like Judas Rebuff, Enduring Resolve, and Unassailable, but in this case we don't really need those, and I'm going to show you why. And it's because of the red CP. So when we get onto the red CP, I am, sl I am slotting Balance Vitality. I do want that little bit of extra max health. I'm not slotting Fortified because I don't really need the resistances. Rejuvenation is still there. Even though it's been nerfed, we still kind of need that 90 recovery. So even though it's not that great, it's still better than nothing in a way. So it, it's frustrating that this has been nerfed, but at the same time, it's the only option we've got for the extra bit of sustain. Um, so that's why I use it. When we look to the, the final ones, we've got Bloody Renewal restores 300 stamina per stage whenever you kill an enemy. Um, so 1,500 stamina every time we kill an enemy, we're going to get that. So this is really important. This is much more difficult to benefit from in group content. So when we're doing dungeons or trials, uh, sustain can be difficult because you're not using bloody renewal. But when you're in a solo situation, that's how you're able to afford utilizing all your skills and abilities because you're going to benefit from return stamina. Our final slotable is the new slottable, Bracing Anchor. While in combat, increase the amount of damage you can block by 4% per stage and reduces your movement speed by 16% at all stages, so we get 20% block mitigation. This build, as a damaged tank with low health, can go and tank bosses in the game that would usually cause us a real problem, and we take no damage. So if we take a little look at this quick clip that I made earlier, this is veteran Asylum Sanctorium against St. Olms. This boss last patch um, in the Blackwood patch would hit us for around 15k with a 45k health, almost maxed out resistance, tank build designed for this trial. So in this trial, usually we'd use Yolnacrin, we'd use something like Elemental Catalyst, we'd have 30k resistances, we'd be able to mitigate a decent amount of damage and we'd be taking hits of about 15k. This build is set up as a damage dealer tank build using the bracelet anchor cp and we get hit for a ridiculously low amount we're getting hit for around 7k damage that is absolutely insane this is on a veteran trial this is a vet trial boss this is a hard hitting boss and it's not taking we're not taking any damage obviously bracing anchor is only useful when blocking if you're not blocking you're going to take a lot of damage but as soon as you hold block you block the amount of damage you can take drastically drops and it's more than the 20% block mitigation seems to reduce damage by about 40%. And I don't understand why, but it does. And by using uh, the 20% block mitigation, as we showed you already, on our the, the Bracing Anchor champion points aren't being accounted for in our block mitigation on this screen because they're only active when in combat. So we're going to be at 90% block mitigation when we're in combat. And what that means is 90% is the cap on block mitigation. You can't get higher than 90% block mitigation. You can get higher of standard mitigation, but you can only reach 90% as a maximum of block mitigation. So we're at the block mitigation cap on a damage dealer hybrid tank build, which is just absolutely unbelievable. In terms of your other champion points, Tireless Guardian, useless champion point passive, but in this situation, it's not too bad. We are probably going to get the full 40 uh, block cost reduction just because we're not using sturdy we're not using any bracing enchants so it's worth getting we're also using fortification for another four percent block mitigation that's how we're able to reach the block mitigation cap because when we use fortification we've got those couple of pieces of heavy uh, when we're using bracing anchor we're at the block mitigation cap so it's worth taking fortification as well you want to take hasty for the increased uh movement speed when sprinting you want to take sprinter uh hero's vigor is really important for the increased max health Tumbling, important again for the reduced dodge roll. Defiance, reducing the cost of break free. And then wherever else you want to put them.
So how to play this build. So the main objective for this build is to be a tank that can do damage. So we're going to show you a few combat situations now just to kind of show you how to utilize that damage. Okay, so going into combat, you do want to make sure you're buffing up before, like pre-fight, you want to be using your buffs. You don't want to be pre-casting your armor buff though, because this isn't going to proc your gear set. 7th Legion is not going to proc unless you're in combat. And this also isn't going to cause damage to the enemy if you pre-cast it. So you want to, you want to pre-cast with Rally and Flames of Oblivion. You're going to instigate combat with your range taunt, just because we're going to get 10% more damage against the enemy when we do so. In combat, we're going to make sure we throw down our caltrops, we use our armor buff, we then hit Venom Claw, and then we go to our back bar, and we apply a Noxious Breath. If you want to cleave for the shield, you can. You drop your ultimate on cooldown, and we just go through a rotation of skills. So I'm going to do a quick uh, kill of this boss now, and just show you kind of how to deal with that rotation. So there we go. Um, as you can see, it's like a 20k DPS in a solo situation. In group content, that, that does go up a little bit because we are missing out on a on a range of buffs um, by using the kind of setup that we are. Um, in terms of like a pass on a trial dummy, I was hitting near 31k. Um, so here's a little look at my pass. As you can see, it, it's decent. When we're buffed up, we are getting a decent number of DPS. Like 30k DPS is fine. 20k DPS in a solo situation like this is not too bad. Um, so we're able to utilize damage uh, quite well. Okay, there is an additional kind of add-on to this build, which is to utilize a companion to go alongside this build for overland content. So... I personally have chose to use Miri within this build and what this is going to do is by utilizing Miri as a companion is you are going to benefit you are going to benefit from about 6-7k extra DPS so especially when you've got an enemy debuffed with your taunt and things like that Miri is going to do more damage so I've, I've not spent a huge amount of time testing I have done a little bit of testing with Miri to kind of get this build to do a decent amount of damage um, but I'll just show you now the kind of setup I'm using for Miri. So, we are using Miri as a damage dealer. So, in terms of the companion gear, uh, the weapon that we're using is a bow. I'm using Shattering. I did see a little bit of an increase in DPS by using Shattering. But any kind of damage-based trait will work for this. Um, and that should be fine. On the gear, I'm using all medium armor. And I'm going to show you why in a second. I've seen some of the damage builds where they utilize light armor sometimes and medium armor and things like that. If you are a damage-based companion, you have to use medium armor. I've gone with aggressive. I have tested some of the traits. They didn't seem to perform as good. Um, but by all means, this isn't a 100% optimized build. I haven't intensively, vigorously tested to see what the best options are. But just from my experience so far, 6-7k DPS um, during combat. Uh, and that was using all aggressive, all medium armor. Um, as you can see there, all aggressive and all medium. Um, and that worked for me. In terms of the jewelry, again, just aggressive jewelry. If you needed a bit more pen to reach the kind of the pen that you want to get a bit more damage that way, you can also do that. So that is the gear, just mostly aggressive um, and then a shattering weapon. You could use a different piece of shattering, but from what I understand, the weapon provides the best source of uh, of the pen by keeping that as a shattering weapon. 
for the skills, I'm just utilizing range-based skills that have got really, really super low cooldowns. So the idea with the companion skills is if you try to use skills that have got really long uptimes, obviously they get cast very rarely, so then you're losing damage and your companion stands there light attacking. So I've gone with skills that are 8 and 12 seconds in duration. And what that means is by the time we've gone through a full rotation, we're pretty much able to rotate back through and do those skills again almost straight after. So first of all, we've got Piercing Arrow. Uh, where Miri does 11,000 physical damage, and that's every 8 seconds, and it's a range skill 35 meters. Uh, we've then got uh, Viper's Bite, 12 second cooldown. Uh, this is going to do poison damage and an additional poison damage. So another big damage skill, 5,539 poison damage and an additional 16,612 over 8 seconds. So just these two skills alone are providing quite a good amount of damage. Then got Sniping Silver. Uh, this has got a 28 meter range. Again, it's got to be a range based skill. You've got to look at the range of the skills and the cooldown. The cooldown is 12 seconds. Um, she fires a Dawn Guard Vampire's Hunter's Crossbow Bolt at an enemy for 11k damage. Um, it deals double damage to Undead. So if you do come up against Undead Daedra or Werewolves, you're going to get even more damage because it's going to hit 22k. Another great skill Starfall. Now, when it comes to the companions, there's no difference between Magicka and Stamina. They're all kind of basically the same thing. So. With this skill, Starfall, it's got a 28 meter range, it's on an 8 second cooldown, it's going to deal 11k damage. Great skill. Finally, this skill is kind of optional, you can use something else if you want. I'm using this because Miri doesn't have any heal, I don't have the ability to heal Miri. Miri's playing at range, so she can heal herself. So with a 28 meter range, 12 second cooldown, uh, Miri can cause damage, 5,539 damage, that's why I used it, because it's a damage and healing skill. Um, and she'll also heal for 8,961 health. So we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. If she she won't she doesn't appear to use this skill unless she's lost health. It doesn't seem to work into her rotation of skills. So this can be a bit of a waste of a skill unless she takes damage. But if she does take damage, she's going to use this. She's going to heal herself. Uh, then we've got the ultimate skill. This is the only ultimate skill, so there isn't really many options. But this is nice and causes a good amount of damage. You do have to be careful of certain skills. So I have tested using Slayer's Blade, for example, because it's 33k damage, but it's only got a 5 meter range. Now, this is only useful if you've got Miri using one hand and shield or dual wield or something where she's really close. In terms of um, the situation we've got this with a bow, this will never get used because she will always dodge roll away from the enemy and will never be 5 meters away. She's always way further than 5 meters, so this skill is not really that useful. Um, things like Warp Strike, you don't really want Miri to be teleporting close to the enemy. You want Miri to stay away, stay at range, stay there using the bow, utilizing those range-based skills and doing as much damage as possible. You will need to kind of go through Medium Armor. This is the important thing. Medium Armor um, increases damage done by 1% for each piece of Medium Armor equipped. So 7% more um, increased damage. I have seen people use Light Armor with a Staff. If you actually look at the light armor passives, increase healing and decrease cooldown of break free. There's no damage benefits from using light armor. So if you're using a companion as a damage dealer, it doesn't matter what type of damage it is, whether it's one hand and shield, whether it's a destruction staff, whether it's a bow, they all need to use medium armor to cause damage. If you really wanted to, if your Miri is dying a lot, you could also decide to use some heavy armor pieces. Um, you could slot a couple of heavy armor pieces, increase the amount of damage blocked, um, but generally, because we've got her set up as a range build, she'll try to dodge all away from the enemy. She'll move away. She's standing really far away. We are on a tank damage build, so we are going to be taunting the enemy. So we shouldn't need to worry too much about her using heavy armor. We want to maximize her damage as much as possible. If we if we take, for example, the, the damage that we just did on the world boss, combine that with Miri's extra 6, 7k, we're at like 27, 26k DPS with us and Miri. In an absolute ideal situation, if we're doing the 30k DPS and Miri's providing that 7k, obviously we're hitting good damage. So if we're in that situation where we are getting buffed by other people and we've got Miri, we are going to be doing nearly 40k DPS combined. Well, that is everything for this build. This was the Accolade Dragon Knight tank build. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you've got any questions on how to use this build or you want to see any other content using this build, let me know in the comments below. Um, or you can ask us in the Tank Club Discord. And you can find the written version of this build also on thetankclub.com. If you'd like to support 
the Tank Club. You can do so in many, many ways. Subscribe on Twitch. We've got Patreon and all those kinds of things. So please, if you do enjoy the content, please consider supporting us um, and that will keep the content coming in the future. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now.